So Adriana, uh, tell me a little bit about your origin story. I mean, it's a very open-ended question, so just answer it how you feel uh, best describes you. <laughs> Th thank you, Andy, and thank you for having me here today. I'm I'm so looking forward to reaching out um, to you and your audience. Um, basically, my origin story. I I was thinking about that, and I. I'm going to relate it to an old John Denver song, <laughs> Rocky Mountain High, in which he says, I was born in the summer of my 27th year. In other words, he hadn't fully gotten to where he wanted to be until he was 27 and discovered the mountains. And that, of course, led his whole career. Um, I got into um, the production business uh, and film and television, radio, actually, to begin with. Um, a little later on than most people. Um, I didn't study it particularly in school. It was always my minors. I have degrees in politics <laughs> um, uh, from uh, in Washington. I went to school in Washington, DC. And I um, made sure all my minors were piano and uh, singing in the choir and uh, anything else I could think of to keep myself involved in production. I just didn't know that's what it was called. Um, so I wasn't lucky enough to have been born early enough where schools had TV studios. Um, now my school has all kinds of things, but uh, it didn't back then. So I did some theater there in school and I'd been studying piano from when I was um, eight years old. I also played violin and guitar. So the arts were for me. Um, my father always hoped I'd you know, fall back on a legal career <laughs> that most politics students follow, uh, but that didn't quite happen for me. So. What I ended up was uh, my origin really began in my almost, just like John Denver, 28th, 29th year, uh, in uh, Great Neck Public Access Television in Great Neck, Long Island. And I was living there at the time and I volunteered as a producer and then they ended up bringing me on. And I had my own community affairs show. I started doing um, production as well as learned editing because just like my name, I'm a bit type A. <laughs> I wanted my hands and everything. Normally a producer sits in the back and the editor, you know, kind of does things, but I wanted to get my hands in there. And lucky I did, because today that's the way it's done. You have to be a producer and an editor. Um, I also started my voiceover career um, at that public access channel um, because somebody didn't show up one day to do a local theater group's little commercial on public access. And so they said, hey, you've got a great, you should do it. You know, and I said, great. I didn't even sure what a voiceover was. So I really began prior to that. Um, I had started in public relations and trying to use my political degrees. I worked on the Statue of Liberty restoration in the 80s, um, 1986, which was a lot of parties. <laughs> but I also worked as a public information coordinator, dealt with the public, dealt with the press, took press tours. So I was always having my hand in it. And somehow when I went to Public Access Channel, it brought together the writing I'd always done the what I thought would be on camera, but I found out I liked being behind the camera better and the technology that I really enjoy. Um, I always have cameras and computers and all of it. Um, so it really brought everything together for me. Um, and also, I was the kid who in the neighborhood put on all those plays that the parents had to sit through, you know, and I'd get all the kids. To, I didn't know that was being a producer. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. So and that kind of led me to um, once I kind of graduated from public access, I ended up uh, working in news, uh, what we call electronic news gathering in uh, New York City. And I worked for, like I like to say, Alphabet, up and down the dial, A&E, History Channel, BET, ESPN, and a lot of court TV, because this was around the OJ time. So we were busy, busy with all those kinds of what we call run and gun. Um, getting all the stories for those um, those outlets, and then they would edit them together, and um, and they would make it to their nightly reports or whenever they were using it for. And from there, I ended up working more directly with A and E and History Channel and a few others for another production company, where I was the production manager, and so I handled every production that came through. Um, we did all those investigative reports with Bill Curtis. Uh, you might remember those. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one hour kind of dramas, uh, you know, kind of investigative. And uh, from there, I and, and then on a couple of films that came through that production company, but my former partner and I, the other D, D squared, um, uh -huh. got the itch to make sure that we would start our own. We got offered, of all things, um, a wastewater treatment plant video for an engineering company. <laughs> and, wow. yeah. yeah. And a film at the same time. And it's a series of films that I've worked on now for 25 years, more like 28 years, um, about the Iraqi Jewish culture and history. 
And that was our first. So we were offered both those things at the same time. And that was, we made the decision to leave our day jobs, as they say, and start D Squared Media. And that was, as I say, 28 years ago. Since then, we've produced, um, I have eight films about the Iraqi Jewish community of varying lengths that have played all over the world. Most famous of them was called The Last Jews of Baghdad. Um, which played on PBS and a number of and festivals everywhere. And it was a community that did not want to tell its story. So it took a long time to kind of get them to trust us and, and, and work with us on it. Um, we just completed our last one. It's called Searching, um, sorry, Saving the Iraqi Jewish Archives, uh, which is a story in itself. I've already gone too long, but I, I can tell you about that later. Wow, so, what a yeah. background. You well, did... thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I uh, and... Uh... Of all of that you've mentioned, I mean, you've gone through a lot of uh, examples of what you've done. Is there is there a particular highlight of it all? Yeah, um, I mean, the Iraqi films are near and dear to my heart because it saved the preservation of the community. Their story. There are now today only five Jews remaining in Iraq, and at one time that was a population of almost two hundred thousand. So their story would not have been told if we didn't. And I, my co-director um, and executive producer, uh, Carol Basri, uh, who has been with, together, we've been doing this for 28 years. So I'm particularly proud of that. But I must say, um, I also produced a narrative film where I um, called Play It By Ear, and it starred Rita Moreno. And so I got to work with the fabulous Rita Moreno on, on set, and I, I was the producer on that. We took it around to a couple of festivals, but Romantic comedies are a little hard to sell out there. <laughs> so documentaries are a little easier in some ways because documentary festivals have, you know, their own niche festivals. There are quite a few Jewish theme festivals, um, you know, other types, human rights, uh, you know, things like that. But there's not one romantic comedy film festival that I know of. <laughs> so <laughs> that one's still... That well, I, you know, I don't, it's easy with all of it you've done to, for me to get off track a little bit, but I guess I can't help myself. I did. did you say uh, there are five, there are five uh, Jewish uh, people of religion in Iraq at, uh, over a time when there was 200,000? Is that That's right? That's right. At one time, uh, Baghdad, uh, between Baghdad and Basra, um, Iraq was 30, uh, almost 40% Jewish. And they trace their history there in Iraq, 2,800 years. So um, needless to say, The Last Jews of Baghdad is a long film. <laughs> it's 105 minutes. How do you tell 2,800 years of history? Um, slowly, the community was, and actually, we're very proud of the fact that our film was the first to make it clear that the Jews in Iraq were legally disseminated from the community. Um, they were um, forced out. They were told they couldn't have a bank account. You can't, you know, and this goes all the way starting in um, the early 19, late 1930s into 1940, all the way to present day. And that's how you get down to five that are remaining there now. Um, what and, an amazing yeah. story that is. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, you've done a lot and, uh, you know, we're uh, benefiting by your experience uh, in the world of voiceover. Um, is there a particular vision that you have uh, in what you're doing? Yeah, B Squared Media is my, you know, my company, as I say, for 28 years. That's a catch-all. Um, we wanted to be a kind of almost laboratory to bring other artists together. And so we do, We weren't just going to be, what do they call us now, multi-hyphenates? Uh, you know, sounds good way, to me. <laughs> producer, writer, editor, uh -huh. you know, chief cook and bottle washer, um, you know, and voiceover. Voiceover was something that, like I say, I sort of stumbled into. Um, but since then, I've myself as a voice artist is one thing. But what I've really enjoyed doing is coaching others. And I've coached hundreds of students um, over the years, over the same 20 odd years. Um, in workshops, in one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, used to be in person. Now they're a little bit more over Zoom and and Skype. Um, and they've all been of varying um, degrees of, of proficiency, but also some that just had a love of maybe performing. But you know, they were in radio in college, but then real life hit, and they had to go, you know, do something else. And now we're kind of coming back around to it. So I've almost exclusively worked with. Um, people in either pre-retirement or those who were about to, or have already retired and now have the time and uh, the resources, frankly, to be able to concentrate on voice acting. 
Well, I want to get back to that, uh, but I do want to ask you, because maybe you're an example of uh, what it takes uh, to do be, be successful, is that uh, it's you've done so many things, it strikes me that perhaps uh, the word survivor uh, is, could be uh, ascribed to you. Do you feel that way, or is that out of choice or necessity? You know, I've, I've often spoken at... Um... Uh, alumni groups and other types of groups that have asked me to come in and speak about independent filmmaking, sometimes also voice acting. And I always start off with, hi, I'm Adriana. I'm addicted to making films, you know, and to telling stories. And that's where, uh, you know, as I said, I, and I always say then too, if your parents don't, un when I was younger, if your parents don't understand what you're doing, you're doing it right. Um, <laughs> because because my, my mom and dad never really did kind of get it, you know, a teacher and my dad was in finance. Um, you know, it, that just didn't ring. They love the arts, but they didn't see it as a way. Dad said, I'm going to be out there with a tin cup, you know, asking for money, you know. But I, what I realized was that as a survivor of sticking to what I wanted to do, and really, I, I went really far into the LSAT process and applying to law schools, got into a couple, um, but just didn't go. And it, in a way, I'm sorry, it would help me in the entertainment business, actually, uh, to have a law degree. But it, it, you're, I think you're right. It is a bit of surviving um, to stick to what, and I'm lucky enough to have been able to have done what I wanted to do. But I think anybody can if you take, do it in your degree. Do what you follow those dreams. Follow, I mean, everybody says that, but make them real. And, and that means maybe adjusting your dream a little bit. You know, I mean, I thought I'd be the next, you know, Pat Benatar or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Carol yeah. King. That's who I really wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> sure. but, but I realized that on camera and in the front of the audience isn't where I really shine. It's, it's behind the camera and in the edit room. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is uh, New York City a better place maybe to have all these varied uh, talents or do you think that could be picked up anywhere? Well, it helps, um, you know, being on the either coast, you know, and Florida, too, is quite a big production state, uh, Chicago, uh, Boston even. Um, but to be honest, the way everything has changed in not just the last few years because of the pandemic, but even before then, um, I have been in recording sessions for voice where the talent was in, you know, the West Coast. Uh, the director was in Texas. The client was in Minnesota, and the engineer was in New York. You know, I mean, you know, it, you can't. And the other part, um, which I, I don't know if you want how specific you want me to get about voice acting, but it is becoming a business where you will work it out of your home. It is no studios are closing left and right. Not so much in those big centers I just mentioned, but um, the home studio has taken over. And that's why that could be a little bit of a trepidation for somebody new to this. If they're not into the tech, you know, kind of thing, it's not that complicated. There's, you know, it's much easier than when you're creating visual and audio, <laughs> like a film <laughs> or a video, <laughs> but it's, um, there's still a little bit of tech to it as well. You have to kind of want that side of it too. And you can get quite successful at it um, in what I like to call the hidden areas in voice acting which I didn't talk about the other side of D squared media. And that's the corporate side. I, I mentioned we did a sewer video, <laughs> but um, you know, that's has been our bread and butter too. I do a lot of medical, a lot of legal. Um, and in fact, um, and then advertising as well. So there's a lot of applications for voice or in my case, video too, in, in the corporate world. Uh, some may be aware of that in their, you know, if we're talking about retirees or those in the working world, they, they may, experience these videos like in human resource offices <laughs> when you have yeah. to watch one of those videos yeah <laughs> well, guess what they pay <laughs> yeah of course uh -huh. and there's always a voiceover and in medical huge i always like to say they can't if a and it's not just to the patients it's also within the medical community to educate about new products new techniques um even to do a, a kind of curriculum vitae of of doctors and and mm -hmm. so they can advertise themselves for other um, hospitals or other communities i always like to say you can't just put up if we're doing something about getting screened for you know i don't know, colon cancer you can't just put up a picture you know you've got mm -hmm. to have a voiceover to it it's got to have that component uh, to reach the audience well. So it's almost like a guaranteed if you're going to do a medical video. There, yeah. there will be a voice component. 
So just to, to get a little bit into the nuts and bolts uh, sort of thing, uh, so someone would have to invest in the uh, equipment. Uh, talk a little bit about that. You probably already have it right there. Um, it's a um, any kind of computer, laptop even, that you might have. I tend to do my, my creative work on a Mac and then tend to do my nuts and bolts stuff and business stuff on a PC, but it could be either. You then need a voice capturing program. Um, and it would be, uh, you know, there are lots of varied kinds. I like Twisted Wave. I mean, there's a there's a ton of them. Everything from something free to something very expensive that um, engineers, professional engineers use, which is something called Pro Tools. You don't need something that fancy. Um, you need something in the middle between that. Then you need a darn good microphone. Um, and it can be even just a USB plug and play. It doesn't have to be a super fancy, you know, microphone hanging in front of you as you would see in a studio. And the biggest thing you need is a space to be able to dampen and quiet where you're going to um, record. Many times what you're recording is auditions, of course, for um, various projects. And sometimes the final product um, and if so, you're, you're not going to be required to actually edit that to the video. You're going to send them all the tracks that you recorded or all the files, if you want to think of it that way. And so you only have to know basic editing. I am not an audio engineer. I never claim to be. My films and everything, all my videos, all I hire outside um, uh, audio people that sweet, they do what they call audio sweetening and clean everything up way beyond my ability. Um, and, but so you don't have to be that, but you do have to get a basic idea of how to send these files to your clients that you're recording for. And other than that, so sound deadening, a good space to work in, and sometimes a walk-in closet is your best friend, believe it or not. Um, bathroom is the worst because that's, that's, that's going to echo all over the place. So you need good sound uh, deadening. You need a good microphone. You need a, a one audio capture program that is also your editing program and then a Mac or a PC, whatever you're going to run it off of. And uh, certainly, and then a lot, This you know, you're gonna not think this was one of the requirements, but you're gonna need to learn to market. If you're not already into marketing, that's what you need to do. Well, I can go deeper into that, but that's a really long discussion. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see here. Um, the two things that jump out are the sound deadening. Now, typically, if someone's saying, well, I'm going to give this a whirl or a shot or, you know, maybe they take it casually I, and maybe they shouldn't. But let's assume uh, people take one step at a time. Uh, a sound deadening room would be uh, if they're in their in their den, let's say, or how would they deaden the sound? You in could there? be in, you're going to buy a product. Um, you're going to depending on how much you can invest everything from something that sits on a desktop that looks like a V and your voice goes in, the microphone goes in it, and you're dead in this way, okay. to an actual sound uh, proof booth. Okay. So we have a lot of basement um, voiceover <laughs> companies <laughs> because everybody you know, picks a little corner of their basement, carpet, deadens the sound, gets you know, foam, and you know, I mean, there's, there's you, my advice would be to um, consult with some, like an audio engineer that can help you create that studio. You know some of the basics of it, but why? I mean, it, it, there's not a huge overhead investment in this business. It's, you don't need a factory. You don't need employees. You don't need anything else. These are the basic tools and they will work for you for a very long time. It's not like you have to keep replacing them all the time either. Um, so it's, it, it's and, and then the other thing is to um, keep, keep, understand the basics of, of what the market is looking for in terms of voice. If I can jump into that, I don't know if I'm- Sure, jumping. that's fine. Um, that is probably, um, Andy, more important or equally as important as the microphone you buy is to understand that there is no such thing. I'm gonna use advertising or the what we call the commercial side of voice acting as an example, but this also applies to corporate work. And I'm fond of saying that 99% of your work is going to come from corporate. Many people out there think they're going to be the next voice of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I hope they all are. Yeah. But that's tough. It's right. hard. And you're competing with celebrities and professional actors. But the main thing is that in, in advertising and corporate wants to be like advertising, you know, like commercial, mm -hmm. uh, it is no longer the deep throated, uh, uh, I'm going to say, you know, a man that is telling you what to buy. 
Uh, Madison Avenue has finally realized that everybody buys things mm -hmm. <laughs> and people want to be sold to, I don't want to be sold to, but they want to be met at their level. And so all voices book all voices book. There's no such thing anymore because it has nothing really to do with your voice. It has to do with creating an emotion in the listener. And that's why I never use the term voiceover anymore. I call it voice acting oh, as okay. many people do. Many people do. I'm not the only one. I didn't invent that, but you are a voice actor. You are transferring emotion from a bunch of words on a page into the mind and the heart of the listener to inspire them to do something, buy something, try something, ask their friend about something. You want to motivate them into action. That's really what voice acting is. Fantastic description. And as far as, uh, I know you said it's a long de uh, description, but if you could just briefly talk about marketing, are we talking about a website or what, what are we talking about? Tons of them. There's what they have out there now, um, are we like to call the supermarket of voices. Um, there are, there's something called voice one, two, three. There's a, a whole bunch of different places out there. I even belong to something called Mandy.com, which is a production site. And Mandy has a whole voice section where people post jobs. But if you keep waiting and only applying to what they're posting, it's you're not going to be busy enough not to call it a true business. And, and again, it's all how much time you can put into it. Uh, but if you actively start to market your talents and try to find producers like me who hire voice talent uh, and do all the work that you need to do ahead of time beyond setting up your physical studio, working with a professional coach to create a professional demo reel. I can't tell you, Andy, how many times I've been in this business a long time. In the old days, I used to get voice actors that would say to me, well, can I just sit it with my tape recorder <laughs> and just read a couple of things? Yeah. So many things wrong with that statement. First one is it is not reading. It is acting. And a lot of people, one of the things I thought we might talk about was you said, what are some of the pitfalls or something? And that is the number one thing. People think, oh, it's reading. Well, I'm retired now. I can set up all the tech stuff. I like all that. I'm mm -hmm. going to do audio books. When you do an audio book, you're doing 200 voices possibly with all the backstories that go with each one of them. They're very complicated to do. None of this is reading. So in marketing yourself, you've got to find those who hire voice talent on a regular basis. It could be audio studios themselves with casting agents. It could be finding an agent for yourself, which is very difficult when you're starting out. But better is to find small production companies like mine, or maybe even slightly bigger, and try to uh, and get them your demo reel. You don't go, by the way, you don't go anywhere in this business without a demo reel. You must have a demo reel. And they're very, very kinds of demo reels. So I'm kind of coming back around to what I'm saying is if you're new to this world, but you're still intrigued by it and you want to learn about uh, voice acting or even production in general, you've got to work with somebody, a coach or somebody who can teach you this world and open it up to you. Because when that happens, you're not only gonna, you know, what do they say, walk it like a duck, talk like a duck, you know, you're not only gonna do all the things and have, you're gonna have that foundation that you're laying for your business. You don't have to build a building, you just have to lay a good foundation. And it's not so much a coach like me teaching you technique as it is getting you to open up, particularly with those of us over 55, who are great for this business. They want voices uh, of that age, but you've got to find, and then the other people you want to find are people like, not just me, but if you, you may in your career know a marketing director in a, in a company or the PR department um, or something. And those folks are also hiring for, uh, they might work with a production company like me to create an internal communication video of, of some kind, but they may also be able to hire you directly depending on what they're doing. For instance, I used to do voiceovers. I'd get hired. One of our clients was um, Smith Barney. And we used to do a weekly, they had a whole TV studio. I mean, all these companies do. And I don't know if that's shocking or news to people now, but it always was back then. Mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley has them. American Express has it. Whole studios that rival anything in, a television, in the television world. And they um, would hire us to do a weekly rap show that we, we did the videotaping for it. 
But one day they were running, they needed a special emergency communication from the president and they needed a voiceover introduction. And I, they knew I did voiceovers. I was there. I did the voiceover for it. Yeah. You know, so there are all these little hidden places that hire talent um, or at least will a, be a conduit for you to find someone like me who hires that 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 talent. I hope that makes sense. So your message is to reach out to these organizations or companies with the prospect that maybe uh, you'll find an opportunity. You need a marketing plan, just like uh -huh. any business has a marketing plan or should have a marketing plan. You need a plan of attack. You need to know what, you know, once you've got all your um, infrastructure put together and you've done some training, uh, and I don't care what level you're at, you, you always could use, well, I always need more training. You, you need, you, once you have that and you've got your good demo reel that you like, um, be it a commercial reel or a corporate reel, I'm getting very specific now, but there are different reels for different ways of marketing. Um, once you have all that in hand, you then have to present yourself out there. And that's when you would start to approach. And you have to decide, is this an A prospect, a D prospect? You know, what, what level is this? I Something that opened up for me, um, my mother was trying to sell her home in Florida. And the real estate agent used one of these mechanical voices, which are even more now. This is a number of years ago. But AI is taking over, you know, so uh, there and it was just horrible sounding. And so just of my own volition, I went ahead and re-recorded it and sent it to them. Well, once that real estate agent heard it, the other real estate agent wanted wanted <laughs> one for their client. And this yeah. one wanted it. And it's, it wasn't a huge paying business, but it was a little little bits here and there. And it got my voice out there. And that's the important thing. That's another way of the marketing, getting sure. your voice heard. So you, so you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do phone systems for people. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. What did you I, say? I do phone I do phone systems for people. You know, press one for da da da. Uh -huh. Press two. Uh -huh. You know, and luckily I had this uh, happened to be real estate again, real estate business where they went through a lot of turnover, and so I got to come in a lot and redo their voices sure, sure. <laughs> for their system. So, but all of that gets you noticed, and that's what you want. You know, that's what that's part of the marketing plan as well. Yeah. And you did mention pay. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit? Well, there is there are rate cards out there, but that tends to fall in the union side of things. Um, I'm talking mostly non-union. I'm not in a in a union uh, for uh, voice acting, uh, but the it's it's more a negotiation process between you and the producer. And what I've always, I used to do in some of the workshops I used to work at, um, I would do a little role play with our, our class, you know, with the class and be able to show them how it works when a producer calls. It's the game is whoever names a price first loses, you know? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> but each project in, in my, look, there's the producers get a bad rap, but in my world, it's always a question of, this is what I have to pay on this particular one. Can you do it? for that. I know that's not your usual rate. Would you be willing? I think you'd be good for the client, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to tell, you tell me no too many times, then we're playing in different ballparks, right? right? If I'm not offering you what, what is right, what I have, and you have to go find others that will. Um, but it, it, it really does vary by, in the, in the corporate world, especially it varies by project. Yeah. And the commercial world, it's a little more unionized, but, and there's a little more of a rate card but there are plenty of commercials out there, local commercials and things like that that don't require, that aren't union-based. And as now, I said, 90% 90, 90 of your work is going to come from corporate. Yeah. So uh, as, as, a, as having clients, I suppose that you help them with some of the things that you're talking about today. Is that right? Or do should they have, uh, or do you focus on something other than that? I, I, maybe I need to understand... Are you helping them with all of the you've just talked about? Or is there something else where you focus on? Do, do you mean with voice students, voice acting students? You, uh, I guess, is, okay, is it, uh, you call them students? Okay, I wasn't sure you call them client or a student, but uh, well, okay. I, I guess in my brain, I tend to think of my clients as the ones who I hire the, the voice actor to be in that production. Okay, okay. Right. For instance, I do a lot of work with New York Methodist Hospital um, in Brooklyn, and they, um, they're my client. Okay. But then I had, I, we were doing a, a video about their mother baby unit that they had just redone and we needed to hire, uh, actually this person was going to be on camera as well as voice, uh, mm -hmm. voice over, voice acting. Um, so that it to me, actually what we call them, Andy, is talent. When you're, when you're in 
the process of production and we're at the point of doing our final voice um, over. I'll say that for the, the term. Right. Um, and we hire a voice actor. You are called the talent. And it, that they're always referred to that way. I, I will say one, I don't know if this is answering a question, but understanding, and I won't go into it here, but understanding the production process and where a voice actor comes into it is extremely important because you then begin to, under, and that's what I've opened up. I've done workshops that are solely about corporate um, video and corporate voice acting because people don't know that world necessarily. I didn't know that world. I fell into it. Um, but when you understand that, you understand the pressures of your producer, me, who's also probably your casting agent. I'm also your director, you know, and so I'm also the editor. <laughs> so it, and it works that way, but the pay is still, this, you know, there's still pay in, in, involved. And it, it's just that it's a different scope of it. Um, and the important thing is that you, if you understand that voice, the voice, like I'll give you this one tip about in the process. So production process goes along. We have an idea. They want to do mother baby video at the hospital. Great. Takes them six months to decide what, what what's the focus, blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Finally, we go and we shoot and we get stuff. Oh, and on day three, the camera fell. And so we have to redo that. And I'm more, my budget's already stretched. Guess when the voice actor comes in? All the way at the end, mm -hmm. all the way at the end of the process. And that can affect what the pay is um, from where we thought we could pay to where all these things happened along the way. The client isn't going to give me more money. So, but I will tell you this, and my, my students have, my voice actors have always been thrilled to hear this. Let's say you do an audition for me and I say, oh, I think you're going to be good for this mother baby video, you know? And I say, well, let's use that piece from your demo reel about uh, Pampers. Okay. That's how, oh, that's great. That's great. Okay. And I send three voices to my client, three men, three women, and they can never decide but they leave it usually up to me. Right. <laughs> well, which one did you like, you know? Right. Um, so, and, and then let's say they fall in love with woman number two. Guess what? I need you now <laughs> yeah. because they love woman number two, but I don't have woman number two as usual $400 an hour. So right. what do I do? <laughs> yeah. It's on me. But if you start to understand that process, I think you make a friend of the producer. You say, oh, my gosh, I heard what happened. The camera fell on day three. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah. I, you know, look, I'll do it for 300. OK, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll, so you see it's a negotiation. But you want to make that person, the producer who's the voice hirer, yeah. want to make that person your friend sure. because we will go back to the same people a lot. OK, that's Great information uh, to know and very helpful. So, um, you know, you, it sounds to me uh, that uh, you're we're talking to you today because you just want people over 55 to know that the uh, market is there. Is that really what your intentions are? That's right. Um, you may uh, look at television and say, uh, let's just use commercials again as an example. Um, first of all, the voice doesn't age the way our exterior does. Um, yes, it ages, but not the same way. So this is an old, this can be an older business. They won't know, you know, they put ages on, on roles sometimes, but it really doesn't mean anything. I've had people who are in their fifties that sound like they're 15. You know, it, it all depends on what they're looking for that day or for that particular product or service. Um, but over 55, what I love about it is that you have this world experience to I have also taught voice acting to children, um, teenagers, and the I can tap into that experience as a director, let's say, not as a coach. There is a difference, but I, I won't go deep into that. But as a director, I can tap into that experience you have, that life experience, and get you to go to an emotional place with your performance that I can't get a younger person to do because they just haven't experienced it. Wow. On the other hand, uh, as we know, I don't particularly love the term baby boomer, but uh, I think it's too encompassing. Right. <laughs> um, but in, in, in any regard, the advertisers believe in it. And those numbers are there. And we don't want to be sold, um, I don't know, life insurance or, or whatever the product is by a really young sounding right. voice. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Just like women don't necessarily want to be sold to by men uh, and vice versa. There's all kinds of studies on that, all kinds. Um, so there's a lot of factors that are in 
um, that are on the plus side, that are assets for an older um, actor, uh, voice actor. You also, if you've always had this yen to want to do this, then you've got a passion and that works for you too. I, I will give a, a, a real, uh, I don't know, whatever, a big tip here. The number, as I said, Madison Avenue changed. We no longer, if it was the 1950s, uh, it would only be a male voice, probably sl slightly British, very deep, telling us what to buy. Mm -hmm. Not now. And what they really want to hear, and these are the key words, is conversational, realistic, have variety in your performances, which is very hard to do. I, I call it the vocal arc, the vocal arc of emotion, vocal arc of emotion, really. And you want to be flexible and believable. Those are a lot of words there, but that, in other words, they, they want it. They will say conversational and keep it real all the time as a direction. Keep it real. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it, it, it's what's relevant to the acting that you're putting across in that from that script. And as I like to say with voice actors, we don't get makeup, we don't get props, <laughs> we don't get costumes, we don't even get another person. <laughs> it's yeah. usually just us. And so you have to somehow create that emotion in emotional response, I should say, in the audience, in the listener or the viewer, you're creating that emotional response only with your voice. That's yeah. not reading. Would you agree, Andy? <laughs> That's tough. It's, uh, it's not. It uh, takes practice and learning, and uh, I, I think it's a good lesson, a lesson here. And um, and for people uh, to get a little bit ahead of myself, but, but for people who really are infatuated by what you're talking about and then right on, and are Actually, you looking for them to uh, get in touch with you or what is it you would like to get out certainly, of? Certainly, I'm always looking to uh, coach people. Um, open up, uh, I could even create uh, through my company, create a, a weekend kind of workshop about um, the corporate world in particular and talk about the, uh, you know, the process of voice acting. As I said, this should all be, if you're just starting it or you've had this, you know, urge and, and this passion for performance or whatever you did maybe in college and radio, as I said before, whatever it is, if you have that passion and it's growing in you, the first thing you want to do is start to learn about that world, unless you already were in it. And even then you want to stay up to date on what the trends are and what they're looking for. Even sure. before you start with your infrastructure or anything else, you want to learn about this business and you want to do the number one thing is don't ever say, Oh, but I hate the sound of my voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's a complete mistake because guess what? What you think of your voice doesn't matter. It's what the person who's hiring you and the client thinks of what they hear. There's, there's two technical reasons, if I can take two seconds. There's two technical reasons why. Number one is you can't hear your voice. Your skull interferes with the sound of your voice. So you don't really hear what other people hear. Number two, we are never, ever, 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 is there a possibility that when you do a voice over, you are not on a microphone. You are always on a microphone. And what the microphone does to your voice, you don't understand. <laughs> we don't understand. It, it pulls little parts out. It mechanizes it. it in my, my case, it makes my high highs a little higher and my low lows a little lower, which, which are kind of nice for a, you know, it. I had a, a director tell me that appeals to men and women, if you can do that. So, you know, all what I'm saying is it really isn't about your voice. It's about what you can make people feel with your voice. Yes. So it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> you know, I'm saying this as a joke, but uh, also... Uh, don't get too much in love with your voice. <laughs> oh, that's what we call announceritis. <laughs> you call that announceritis. That people and and these days, and I challenge anyone look at a Geico ad, um, the I or any other one, especially on the radio. If you hear an announcer voice, that is the opposite of conversational, right? If you mm. hear an announcer or an orator, you know a lot of people come. To, I've coached people that are. Um, speakers in in church and things like that, and they do a lot of that kind of uh, preaching. And I have to shift them all around because that's not what this is. You're not speaking at when you see an announcer or you hear one, it's because they're making fun of it <laughs> <laughs> these days, these days um, it is. I mean, you can have the most gorgeous sound and that's lovely. That is wonderful. And that might give you a leg up on some, 
but not all. Yeah. It's variety, as I keep doing my vocal arc here. Um, the variety. If you only got that one sound, that's all you're going to book. And not every job wants that. Yeah. So okay. if that's the other thing that working with a professional coach will help you um, is to learn to find what I call your sweet spot. What's my vocal sweet spot? And then where can I stretch it here and stretch it there and, and offer this emotional approach and that emotional approach? Some I'm getting a little deeper here, but some people can do, you know, empathetic, empathetic, warm, caring very well. And some people can't do sarcasm. <laughs> you know, they, they, yeah. they just can't. And sarcasm mm -hmm. is a big tool these days wow. <laughs> in advertising. So wow. it's, it's, it's learning to go to those emotional places. And just like any actor will tell you, it's, you have to be vulnerable. You have to let yourself go to those places. And sometimes they're scary places uh, of reaching back in your childhood or, or, or something, you know, that you go to experience that emotion. Um, so it's, um, it, it's really a question of if you work, you can't analyze your own voice. You cannot, mm -hmm. I can't analyze mine. I work with a producer when I do mine, when I uh, go to redo my demo reel. So okay. it's, it, it's, it's important that you, that you do work with, I don't, you know, I'm not pushing just for me. I'm just saying there are a lot of people out there that are teaching voice acting, some, you know, bigger than others, but it's a, a question of where you feel comfortable and where you feel you can relate to that coach and that they get what you have to bring so that we can shape you a little bit more in some other direction. And what goes with that is the ability to, um, uh, uh, accept criticism. Yep. Uh, how, how hard is that to, to do? How hard is it to take? But I give a, a, a brief anecdote. I was on a panel one time with a casting agent who turned out to be a very good friend of mine and the students, the potential voice act, the future voice actors in the audience. And they asked a question of the casting agent and they said, you know, if I go on an audition for you and I don't book the job, can I give you a call the next day and ask you why, you know, what I could do better? And the casting agent looked like the the student had just said the moon was made of cheese or something. I mean, she, it, it was completely foreign to her because it has nothing to do with that. I understood where the student was coming from. She's wanting to get better, but your casting agent or your voice hirer is not your coach. They're there to get a job done for the client, right? And and in fact, you don't even get, if you don't get call back after your initial audition, you didn't book the job. I mean, you're not in consideration. So, you know, even if you get a call back, you may, they're not going to call you and tell you, they only call the person who books it. That, 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 that's how it works. So, you know, it, it, it's important to have to surround yourself with the right professionals and then not to take anything that that day you didn't book that one, but guess what? The next day, your voice, the same voice, the same thing was right for what they wanted. Or maybe, you know, in national commercials, Sometimes they are made for different um, areas of the country, different geographic locations. Uh -huh. And so maybe you'd work well because you have a slight Midwestern, you know, tinge there. <laughs> we, mm. we don't like to say accent. We like to say regionality. Uh, but you have a slight regionality. Uh, and so you weren't right for the New York of those same words, those same words on script on the page. But you were right for that. You, you don't know. I mean, you know, it's really not a personal thing it is and that's hard i i definitely am a, a sensitive kind of person and i took me a long time my friend said you have to develop a skin like a rhino <laughs> in his best new york accent a skin like a rhino yeah um and uh would there be well let me ask you you know you, you're full of such great information um thank you can you just give me a sense of, if someone were to you to uh what is it hire you as a coach what kind of rates are they looking at um, they would look at a series of about five or depending on their skill level or, or familiarity with voice acting. Um, we would do first an evaluation of, uh, of, of some type of copy where I, then I could get, judge a little better what voice they're in and what their skill level is. That would all be free. Um, and then from there, I would create a series of I have a template I work off of, but then I try to individualize it into a series of about six sessions one hour sessions usually um, that where we would work on copy. That's what we call scripts work on copy that would help develop that vocal arc would teach about uh, the industry, about production itself, talk about 
a little bit about marketing, a little bit about tech, but mostly the goal is to develop everything so that you come out with a demo reel. Okay. And that, then I would also be your director for your demo reel. I would direct you through that session, which would be at a professional studio. You don't do your demo reel at home. Even if you have the world's best setup there, you do it in a studio because it's, it, it's just the right way to do it. Sure. And it's better in the long run. We decide what demo reel was right for you to begin with. And um, through that whole series of courses, it varies. I would work with people on the rate of what that would be. Um, the demo, uh, the one thing I can control would be the studio in their area. Um, that would be whatever the, I have, you know, studios I work with, I could suggest that would be whatever their cost was and would be, usually we can do it in about an hour. So it's, th th that's not bad. Studios can run anywhere in New York. It can run, you know, $600 for an hour, but it depends, you know, I have deals and there are people out there that are willing to work with you. Um, and for my work with you for about those six sessions, depending on it, it would be anywhere in a range from, I'd say between 800 to maybe up to 1500, something like that. I don't mean to be have such a wide range there, but it does really depend on how much work we need to do to familiarize you with the uh, market that you're going to be right for. You know, corporate is very wide open, the, the corporate videos I talked about, but not every voice is right for corporate work. Um, very high pitched um, female voices generally don't work well in, in corporate setting. Um, the uh, It doesn't always have to be a deep baritone, you know, nothing like that, but it, it, some won't be right. And so we have to make that decision. By the end of when you're you know, a couple of years of being in this business, you should have a commercial reel and a corporate reel. And you may also want to do audio books or you, and those are all specialized reels. Some people like doing cartoon voices and animation. Um, I didn't get into that field as, as, to talk about it today as much, but that's a huge business. Video games are huge. If you get into that animation and video game and you like to play with your voice and do those types of, um, all kinds of sounds and things like that. That's a reel to itself too. You never mix these reels. It would be unprofessional in, in the business out there, but there's a lot of work that can be done. And I'll tell a great story. Uh, a student of mine in a, in a workshop I did one time, he was in his seventies and he didn't think he could do, do this. And somehow or another, he found maybe on one of these sites, you know, voice one, two, three or something, some British uh, gaming firm was looking for an old wizard to sound <laughs> like, and they he couldn't even do it. He, they didn't want. They said do a fake British accent. We don't. He couldn't even do it. You know, yeah. and it, they loved him, and he mm -hmm. kept getting repeat business. And he was so thrilled that he had had done that and and really tried. So you don't know when the opportunity is out there. But uh, uh, one quick word about accents because I always worry about this. I never ever coach anybody to put on an accent if they don't already have that either from a parent growing up or they are a speaker of another language. If you're bilingual, you, you got a great career ahead of you. Um, but it, 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 we don't like to put on accents unless they're trying to make a joke about it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't, it's only something that you're native to. My sister-in-law is from Ireland. And after knowing her for 30, whatever year, 36 years, I know I, I can slip into that with her sometimes when I speak with her, but I never say I can do an Irish regionality. I, I would never say that because I didn't, it, it's not native to my, to my ear. Brooklynese, that's another story. <laughs> well, you sound like a great, uh, a real pro. Uh, what might be a great takeaway uh, you could share today? Hmm. Well, I, I'd like to encourage people um, to, I, I started by saying, follow your dreams. And that sounds so trite, Andy. <laughs> um, what I, what I want to say is you know, I had a lot of, I, I, I really do like your survivor word. I, I had a lot of reasons why I shouldn't do this business 28, almost 30 years ago, why I shouldn't have done this. Um, I, I lived on change for a while, you know, I mean, when we were starting out and, and, and uh, cornflakes, but it, it really, when you meet your passion, as I think you can hear from me today, yeah. after 30 plus years in this business, um, you know, it, it has nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And even the rejection that we spoke about before, which there will be many more, just like a, right? Doesn't a, a batter, uh, you know, if you're batting 300, you're sure. actually losing seven right. minutes every time. <laughs> you're striking out. But even all those failures, you know, or they're not failures, even all those non-acceptances somehow fade away when you get that one. 
You know, when you get that one that really hit home. For me, it was, you asked me some of my memorable, when I, uh, we played at the Toronto Jewish Film Festival with the Last Jews of Baghdad. And I went up on stage um, where they asked, you know, Q&A with the audience. And a man stood up and first of all, a fist fight broke out before the film started because they had overbooked <laughs> people. No. They thought we wouldn't book. They didn't think a lot of people would come see it. And that's the uh, biggest Jewish film festival in the world, Toronto Jewish. And in any case, the man stood up and he said, I just have to thank you. This would have been in like the early 90, uh, 2005. And he said, I have to thank you because now my children understand and my grandchildren will understand what it was like to be a, a Jew in Iraq and, and where that and why, uh, you know, who I am. Now they know and they've seen it. And I have to thank you. I have to tell you. All any money I've ever made never felt as good as that did. <laughs> yeah, great story. Um, are you up for a quick little lightning round? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. So, when looking for a new gig or a new job, uh, is there a possibility of being too aggressive or not aggressive enough and trying to nail that job down? And not to answer a question with a question, do you mean as a voice actor or as a producer? Oh, uh, well, I guess for someone, uh, since we're speaking to voice actors uh, who, who are looking be... for jobs, uh, is yep. there, uh, can you be too aggressive or not aggressive or not pushy enough? You can be too aggressive and you can be too pushy. Um, I've had people where, why didn't you call me for a job? Well, I don't have anything that suits what you're doing. The answer, the proper answer to that question is, if I'm not keeping you busy enough, you need to find six other me's you need to go find other places where you're marketing yourself. So instead of wasting time, just like the person who asked, you know, can you tell me what I was doing wrong? Um, you know, I have had people where they, they hound me um, a bit and I like to call it stay in gentle contact with me, you know, and, and that's gotten easier with technology, um, you know, emails and such, but there were times where people would be aggressive. In, and even in the booth, um, I had somebody, and I think it was an attack of, if it is the opposite. I think they were feeling like they weren't doing a good job. I had someone first time, but that's who the client liked. She went in the booth and this was a corporate legal gig and she kept doing a line and we kept saying, all right, you know, they can't hear what you're saying in the outside and when you're in a proper studio. Mm -hmm. And so we'd say, hold on, hold on. And we would talk amongst ourselves, me and the client, we're writing things and we're going back. Okay, let's do it again. No, 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 no. She came out of the booth she took her headset off, which you never do because you can cause feedback through the microphone. But anyway, she took her headset off. She poked out of the booth and she said, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and we said, nothing. We're still writing the script. <laughs> you know, it wasn't her fault. And so I think that aggressiveness comes from a good place of wanting to do a good job, wanting to succeed in this business. But be aware. That's why I say learn about the world of production. Because if you understood the pressures on a producer or your director, or that client, um, it, it really helps. It helps keep it all in perspective. And don't and partly you're saying don't take it personally. And believe in yourself. You mm -hmm. wouldn't be there if they didn't want you. So you know, by her not believing again, like I said, doesn't matter what you think of your voice. You book the job. You're there because they wanted you. You they heard something, whatever. Um, and so you have to believe in and and, and frankly. Again, this is a little deeper, but we went, if you're thinking about what me and the client are doing, writing, and you're thinking about your performance and you're listening to your voice, you're not in character. You're not being a voice actor. Wow. You're reading. Mm -hmm. you, you've slipped out of uh, Becky, who's got a problem with her son's high school principal or whatever the mm -hmm. video is about. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you're not being that person anymore. Uh, and you're, or you're not, you're not staying true to that emotion. You're now having an emotion of panic or uh, doubt, guilt, whatever those things are. Those are valid emotions, but not what they were asking for in the script. So you got and, to that. Yeah. Well, you've answered a lot of questions that come into mind, but uh, perhaps someone who sees this won't see all the answers. So let me ask you, uh, for someone just starting out, do you just blanket yourself and uh, or do you get real picky on everything? Do you just blanket on every opportunity or do you become more picky on what you uh, do auditions for and all that? I'll say tailor. <laughs> you tailor where you're going to market yourself. And of course, where you have an in, go for it. That's your best resource. Um, I one time advised somebody and it worked really well. Um, she was 
well, there's two stories, but okay. Um, she with lo local nail salon, you know, where she went in all the time and they knew her so well. And I said, why don't you suggest to them that they need a, a video for their website yeah. and it needs a voice and you could be the voice. And sure enough, she made the suggestion. They did it. Did they have big bucks? No, but guess what? She had no competition either. She didn't have to audition or anything. They were just so excited that she offered the idea. I have to say one other example. Um, for those that are not retired yet, or maybe also do other things, I had a student who was a, a banker, a mortgage banker in uh, North Carolina. And she, when she came uh, for a workshop, you know, we worked with her a lot and, uh, you know, she was very good. She had a, a, you know, nice approach, nice sound, all of that, and was very easy to work with, very flexible. But what happened was we taught her to listen more. Mm. We, we taught her that and in voice acting, when you're alone, it's hard. When you're on a stage with somebody, you know, there's back and forth. But we have to learn to create a dialogue in our head. It's again, it's not easy. Um, but she and she had learned to do that so well that she got a promotion at her bank because the mm. um, manager said, you are now relating to the customers in a way I never saw you relate to them before when mm. they would come to talk to her because she was learning those, uh, applying those skills that she learned from voice acting to listen react, create an emotion in the, in the listener. So by doing that, she got a promotion at work. So I think some of the lessons of voice acting are applicable um, in other parts of your life. If I'm a newbie at this, uh, will people, will hiring managers look down on me? Mm -mm. There's nothing to do. That is the one beautiful thing about our, your demo reel. You don't actually ha have to have booked those commercials or, or corporate videos that you put on your demo reel. A uh, demo reel, by the way, is only about a minute, less than that, actually, for um, for commercial. Uh, so you don't get much time. It's all what they hear. It's all what they either hear on the audition of the actual script or whatever they're using for audition, or it's off of your demo reel, which is the way I tend to hire people is off of the demo reel. Because in corporate, we don't always have the budget or the time to have a full audition process. In fact, as I told you, we haven't even sometimes written the script yet. <laughs> We're still working on it. Yeah. So it's it's really a question of, um, you know, allowing that, making the best demo reel you can at that phase of your career, revisiting it just like you would a resume over, over time, but you don't have to have actually booked any of those jobs in order for them to be there. On my demo reel for my company, for D Squared Media, I have to <laughs> have actually created those films or created those um, the videos, um, but that's not so in voice acting. It's all, because it's all about again more evidence to the point that it's about how you sound in that moment, meeting what that client is looking for for that particular video service product, whatever it is. So it's 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 a, it's a bit of a it's kind of like amazing that it ever comes together, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it does. Should I ever worry that my voice might sound too old or maybe there's something I can do? You can't to not do like anything that. about, you can't do anything about it. Yes. The, you can have, I'm, I'm not a speech person, a pathologist or someone, but there are techniques you can do to strengthen your voice, to uh, lower the pitch or the range. Some people who are, when you push it out and come in their nose and come down way up here. And they, they've just gotten into speaking that way. And they, they it's a habit. And, and so you have to learn breathing is important. Um, there are, there is the, I don't claim to be any medical person, but there is that side of it that if I hear a voice or sometimes people have a very damaged voice, it's raspy or it's, um, uh, it's that we call it damage. And that could book depending on what they're looking for, it could. But more than likely, you could be harming yourself. And so that would be important not, you know, to see somebody about um, in, in the medical profession. And if you're new to this, uh, how do you handle rejection? <laughs> mm. um, I had a student who just was so excited the other day. He's been at this for six years and really nothing, little dribbles here and there but he booked a local commercial the other day. You have never, and he's in his sixties. He, you've never seen anybody more excited. And it's just some, you know, little, I don't know, car wash or something in, in his, I think he's in uh, Maryland. And, and just, you know, he's so excited. Did he not quit his particular day job? You know, no, he didn't, you know, he kept doing this, but that one success 
can do so much. I'm going to flip your question around. Instead of talking about the rejection, I'm going to talk about the success. That one success outweighed those six years of, of nothing practically um, that came his way. And it has spurred him on. I won't say he's booked another one again yet. He hasn't told me, but this was just the other day. But it has a tendency the success has a tendency to feed on itself. And not only that, it accomplished something else. He now had a commercial out there that he that people were hearing his voice. That would probably make it all worthwhile. Right. And you don't know who's hearing that. You don't it could be another producer like me that says, oh, my gosh, that's the sound I've been looking for. I did that once. I heard somebody in a commercial. I needed somebody who was a native Spanish speaker but was in an English script, in an in a, a English script. Um, and I could, I heard this person. I wanted that person. I tracked that production company down and I found that person. And, and it was perfect for what my client wanted. Uh, it fit the bill. So they, if they, like I said, when they want you, they want you. <laughs> and they will do what they have to do to get you because they are convinced that that is the way they're, and, and I, I do a lot of research for advertising agencies, uh, what they used to call qualitative analysis. Uh, and, you know, people think of them as uh, focus groups. They're much more intricate than that now. And we spent weeks with people sometimes just studying their habits and, you know, what they did with technology, whatever the product was. They invest, uh, clients or corporations invest 10 times more money in that research than they do in the actual commercials. So by the time they've gotten around to hiring the voice actor and the, and the sound they want, they're not going to move a comma. They're, they're not, they, they know what they want. And so if you fit the bill, you fit the bill. And they, like I say, and if that's so, uh, what's the, the fame, you know, flow of uh, the uh, progressive, uh, the insurance, you know, oh. she's now signed her life away to that particular brand. You know, they, she, she's what they call a brand ambassador. She is the image of it that, you know, People fight for that kind of uh, gig, but the truth is, I bet she's feeling a little tired of playing Flo. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> my, right. my imagine, I'd imagine. Yeah. So it's you can get typecast, but right. that should all be our problem. Is <laughs> that's right. Well, everything you've said is just brilliant, and I uh, and it's great information, and uh, I really appreciate your time. I thank you so much for having me, and I wish all those future voice actors out there or anyone who wants to even make a movie, <laughs> um, you know, I hope you do do take a little few steps down that road so that you get a little sense of it. And that little bit will spur you on to something else. And so I, I applaud everybody who takes, takes those steps. And I welcome to hear from anybody.